old man Bickford, cattle, oil, real estate. He's one of the poker-playing, whiskey-drinking, evil old men who run the United States of America. <clears throat> to these backstage operators, presidents, cabinet ministers, and ambassadors, are just jokes and errand boys. They do what they are told to do or else. His subordinates never know why they have fallen from favor. That is for them to figure out when his displeasure falls heavy and cold. Just Sanford knows he is in trouble when the old man steers him into a little side room with one chair. The old man sits down and smiles. You know, Jess, I've got an intuition about you. I think you'd make a mighty fine president. <clears throat> Jess turns pale. He is hearing his death warrant. <clears throat> oh, no, Mr. Beckford, I, I don't have the qualifications. I disagree with you. I think you do have the qualifications. You've got a good front and a fucking big mouth. <clears throat> now Jess knows he talked too much in the wrong place at the wrong time. Please, Mr. Bickford, I got a bad heart. The job would kill me. Bickford's smile widened. Think about it, Jess. Uh, just think about it. I wouldn't want to see you make a mistake. Going to have a little, uh, little change of pace here, a little uh, change of thrust uh, with the lovely Laurie Anderson... Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, we're just going to tread water here for a minute. Uh, last year, I was on a uh, twin-engine plane from Milwaukee to New York City, uh, and just over LaGuardia, one of the engines uh, conked out, and we started to drop straight down, flipping over and over. Then the engine died and we went completely out of control. New York City started to get taller and taller. A voice came over the intercom and said, Our pilot has informed us that we are about to attempt a crash landing. Please extinguish all cigarettes. Place your tray tables in an upright position. Your captain says, please do not panic. Captain says, place your head in your hands. Captain says, put your knees to your chin. Captain says, put your hands on your eyes. Captain says, put your hands on your head. Put your hands on my knees. <laughs> this is your captain. Have you lost your dog? We are going down. 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 Together. As it uh, turned out, uh, we were caught in a downdraft and crammed into a bank. Uh, it was a miracle. Uh, but afterwards, I was uh, terrified about getting onto planes uh, for months. The minute I started walking down the aisle, my eyes would clamp shut, and I would fall into a deep, involuntary sleep. My mind would shut down. You don't want to see this. You don't want to be here. You will lose your dog. Finally.
finally, I was able to regain consciousness, but I'd always have to uh, go up to the forward cabin and ask the stewardesses if I could sit next to them, you know, hi, uh, mind if I join you? Uh, and they were always rather irritated, you know, oh, all right, what a baby. And I watched their uniforms crack while we made nervous chit-chat. Uh, sometimes even that didn't help, and I'd have to find one of the other passengers to talk to. And you can spot these people immediately. There's one on every flight. Someone who's really on your wavelength. I was on a flight from L.A. when I spotted one of them sitting across the aisle. A girl of about 14. She had a stuffed rabbit set up on her tray table, and she kept arranging and rearranging the rabbit and kind of waving to it. Hi. Hi there. Moving it. And I decided, this is the one I want to sit next to. Uh, suddenly, I realized that she was speaking in an entirely different language. Computer ease, a kind of high-tech lingo. It was amazing. If she didn't understand something, it just didn't scan. Everything was circuitry, electronics, switching. We talked mostly about her boyfriend. He was never in a bad mood. He was in a bad mode. Modey kind of a guy. Uh, the romance was apparently kind of rocky. And she kept saying, oh man, you know, like, oh man, you know, like, it's so digital. And she just meant, of course, that the relationship was on again, off again. Always two things, switching current runs through. And then it doesn't. It was a language of sounds, of noise, of switching. It was the language of the rabbit of the caribou, the beaver, and the penguin, a language of the past, current running through bodies, on again, off again, one thing instantly replaces another, the language of the future. Put your knees up to your chins. Have you lost your dog? Put your hands over your eyes. Jump out of the plane. You are not alone. This is the language of the on-again, off-again future, and it is digital.
Lenny K is going to do a reggae song. Hey, Lenny. How do you spell New York? A knife, a fork, a bottle, and a cork. I'd like to send this out to uh, Miss Revenge, whoever she is. said that I should leave her alone But how can I do that when I want her for my own I've watched her change from toys to boys and now she is my size So how can I convince her now that she should be my bride Mama, I love your daughter No jester in No one could make me leave her No jester in So you can tell her anything you want But I'll never let her out of my sight Tell her for me she's not my kind But one day she's gonna be my wife I love your daughter No gesture in No one could make me leave her No gesture in They told me I should wait Until 21 But how can I do that Well I'm a very impatient stuff guys and guys can do that you know I mean I always was jealous because I wasn't homosexual you know because you know they, they got all this Mayan stuff and all the screen stuff and I'd read all these books you know and blue jelly and all you know this you know how it is and, and I thought fuck you know I can't you know and I have these dreams that like I could like you know like steal boy skins at night and put them on and pee and stuff like that but now that I've like found like this new toy um, <laughs> this isn't. <laughs> I got seven ways of going. I got seven ways to be. I got seven. 
seven sweet disguises, seven ways of being me. Right here is where I usually tell the story. I usually tell the story. God. I usually tell the story about something that happened to me on one of these particular voyages, but I'll make it real fast. I was expecting to go to my usual stuff with all these like, you know, like, like we're, these like girl boy, Muslim, Christian angel guys, you know, that like have these like all these machines, all these like neon machines and they put you in and like on this pine tree shape. But this time, I don't know how it happened, I got to 16th century Japan. And it was, it was and the, the neat thing about it was, it was the first time that I got to really be a boy. And I was like this boy, this, this like ninja boy, this archer. And like he was in, totally in love with a sister who looked just like him. And he, he wanted to become, he couldn't care for her. He wanted her to have the best. So he could, became the best archer. And so the king took him as his top archer. And he took his sister to the palace. And the king fell in love with his sister. And the archer who had worked and worked and worked to get his sister fine garments didn't mean to get her fine garments in the king's bed. So when the king sent him out the next day, he was walking through the fields. He had on his armor and his black and white squares like a chessboard. He stood on the black square and looked and saw how the black square looked like the back of his sister's hair. He looked at the window shape in the palace, in the castle. He imagined the king over his sister, his black and white sister. He was so dazzled by that photograph that he took off his armor, laid his armor down, and took the dart and named it swift at the king's heart and he started walking toward the castle started walking toward the palace started walking he was walking he was walking he was walking in this big step i am taking seven seizures for the true i got seven ways of going seven ways of loving you be Free of all deception, be safe from bodily harm. Love without exception, be a saint in any form. Thank you. Um, listen, December 8th is um, another... Um, December 8th is that? It's December 7th. The kids don't know anything anymore. I don't even know what the fuck Pearl Harbor. Um, December 8th is uh, Jim Morrison's birthday. And uh, I know that the disappearance of Jim Morrison has caused us much sadness, but um, he, he, was, uh, he, was, uh, he gave us a lot of pleasure. And there's a new record coming out, um, which I think is the most. Uh, it's out? Well, you know, I've been out of town. <laughs> Everything happens in New York first, you know. Uh, this little poem that Lenny and I made for uh, Jim Morrison a few years ago. A father no no gin took my baby away. Father, no, not Jim, took my baby away. Took her up and off my wavelength, swallowed up like the ocean in a fire, thick and gray. Death came sweeping up the highway like a lady's dress. Death comes riding up the highway in its Sunday best. Death comes driving, death comes creeping. Death comes, there must be something that remains. I usually fuck that part up. Well, that made me sick and crazy. 
Cause that fire It took my baby Away Lenny K. This is part of a diary from 1962. We were in the room, and then the coach, he told me to take my shirt off and try on the top of the uniform. And I did that too. And then he told me that it fit perfectly over my body, and he started to rub my body and take it back off me again. And then he said, take off your pants and try on these bottoms. So I took off my blue jeans and threw them across the arm of the chair next to me. And he handed me the shorts and told me that I shouldn't wear any underwear when I tried them on because the fit might not be right. I hesitated a minute. Holy shit, I thought, what the fuck have you gotten yourself into or out of or whatever the fuck was going on? And I was really nervous whether I should punch this guy out or if I should take off my pants and be cool and just try on the shorts and so what if he sees my prick anyway? I'm only 12 years old. I took off my underwear and I was standing there totally naked and Mike's eyes were popping out. And I went to pull off the shorts to see if they fit but he stopped me and he told me that he wanted to take my measurements first and he sort of took my body and leaned it against the wall and began to measure my thighs and my calf muscles, 13 inches, by the way. And then the fucker did it. He pressed his palm very softly against my prick and my balls and said that he should measure that now. No more, I thought. I took that motherfucker, and mostly by instinct, I guess, gave him a pretty solid fiver over the back of his neck. Then I got angry. He was down on his knees from that punch and just took him by his face and pushed him so that his head hit on the brass bedpost, and then I simply whipped my clothes on again, picked up the uniform, and made it to the door, where he came running after me and told me not to be angry. August 7th, 1965. Tonight we got drunk, but not as bad as last night, so we went over to some terrible bar and tried to pick something up. The guy told us that the, <laughs> the, guy told us that the Celia sisters were heading down toward the beach. I had gotten a blowjob once from Alice Celia, and a little sister had quite a reputation herself. So Willie and I headed after them. When we caught up to them, we waited about ten feet behind and watched them duck into an alleyway. They were both stone drunk. When we passed by, we saw them making out with each other all over the concrete. Boy, that really turns me on, Willie said to me. Then he called for Alice, and she came over and said to me, I remember you. You came in my mouth, and it tasted like strawberries. This girl is really fucked up, I thought. She was only 14, too. Her sister was 13. Want to go down to the beach with us? I asked. Okay. On the way over to the beach, Alice pissed right in the street. But I don't want to soil my diary with a description of that. Then some other guys spotted us with them and told some other guys who told some other guys. And I swear before long, the whole fucking town was on the beach waiting for blowjobs. jobs. One guy came up to me and asked what was going on. These two girls, I think, are about to give out an awful lot of low jobs, I said. Get in line, someone else told them. Willie and I left that fucking scene, got a ball, and went down to the courts in the dark to practice foul shots for the game tomorrow. Just setting up for the great uh, Frank Zappa. Hiya. How you doing tonight? All right, um, as you know, I'm not the kind of a person that reads books. I've said this before many times. I'm not fond of reading. But I, do, I have in the past made exceptions. And uh, one of these exceptions was this part of the, the book that I'm sure you know called Naked Lunch. And I have received permission 
to read the part about the talking asshole. Yeah. So, before I do, uh, I discuss with Mr. Burroughs before we came out here some of the details that led to the construction of this section of the book. I asked him where he got the idea for this part, and he said that it was derived from the ventriloquist scene in the dead of night, if you know that film. And I had a little bit of trouble following that for a moment there until he made it all very clear to me by saying that uh, it was like uh, when you have a ventriloquist dummy and suddenly the dummy starts talking for you. And so with that introduction, I start on page 132 and it goes like this. <clears throat> Did I ever tell you about the man who taught his asshole to talk? His whole abdomen would move up and down, you dig? farting out the words. It was unlike anything I ever heard. This ass talk had a sort of gut frequency. It hit you right down there like you gotta go. <laughs> you know when the old colon gives you the elbow and it feels sort of cold inside? And you know all you have to do is turn loose? Well, this talking hit you right down there. A bubbly, thick, stagnant sound. A sound you could smell. <laughs> this man worked for a carnival, you dig. And to start with, it was like a novelty ventriloquist act. Real funny, too, at first. He had a number he called the better O that was a scream, I tell you. I forget most of it, but it was clever, like, Oh, I say, are you still down there, old thing? <laughs> nah, I had to go relieve myself. After a while, the ass started talking on its own. He would go in without anything prepared, and his ass would ad-lib and toss the gags back at him every time. <laughs> then it developed sort of teeth-like little raspy, incurving hooks and started eating. He thought this was cute at first and built an act around it, but the asshole would eat its way through his pants and start talking on the street, shouting out it wanted equal rights. <laughs> it would get drunk, too and have crying jags, nobody loved it, and, and, wanted to, and it wanted to be kissed, same as any other mouth. Finally, it talked all the time, day and night. You could hear him for blocks screaming at it to shut up, and beating it with his fist and sticking candles up it. But nothing did any good, and the asshole said to him, it's you who will shut up in the end, not me, because we don't need you around here anymore. I can talk and eat and shit. After that, he began waking up in the morning with a transparent jelly like a tadpole's tail all over his mouth. This jelly was what the scientists call UNDT, undifferentiated tissue, <clears throat> which can grow into any kind of flesh on the human body. He would tear it off his mouth and the pieces would stick to his hands like burning gasoline jelly and grow there, grow anywhere on him. Grow anywhere on him a glob of it fell. So finally his mouth sealed over, and the whole head would have amputated spontaneous. Did you know there is a condition occurs in parts of Africa and only among Negroes where the little toe amputates spontaneously? Except for the eyes, you dig? That's the one thing the asshole couldn't do was see. It needed the eyes. But nerve connections were blocked and infiltrated and atrophied so the brain couldn't give orders anymore. It was trapped in the skull, sealed off. For a while, you could see the silent, helpless suffering of the brain behind the eyes. Then finally, the brain must have died because the eyes went out and there was no more feeling in them than a crab's eye on the end of a stalk. Please mind the sore 
old auntie dear don't hide your bones old uncle dear i hear your groans oh sister dear how sweet your moans oh children death go breathe your breaths sobbing breath so eats your death pain is gone tears take the rest genius death your art is done lover death your body's gone father death i'm coming home guru death your words are true teacher death I do thank you for inspiring me to sing this blues Buddha death I wake with you Dharma death your mind is new Sangha death will work it through Suffering is what was born ignorance made me forlorn dear full truth i cannot scorn father breath once more farewell birth you gave was no thing ill my heart is still as time will tell Yeah.